He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Such good news. The stone has been rolled away, the stone of the curse, the stone of iniquity, the stone that would hold him down and hold us down has been rolled away. And what a great day to worship today. Before, before we go into the word, I, I just wanted to show you, Helen and I were away for three weeks. It's the longest we've been away from church ever, um, where we went away to meet our son and our daughter-in-law and our grandchild. Um, we're enjo I'm enjoying being in Mkuru, by the way. <laughs> Here you can see we were dedicating Stevie Joy, who's really a bundle of joy. She's beautiful, such a beautiful gift of life. And we had two weeks with Joshua and uh, loved holding Stevie Joy and ministering to her. And you can see that's the day that we left and enjoyed walks with Joshua. Then we went to CLC Dayton, Ohio, to meet with Pastor Stan, had a tremendous time there. So thank you everyone for allowing us, and encouraging us to go away. And well done to the team for continuing to lead the ministry here. Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you, Father. <laughs> In looking after Stevie Joy and holding her, it's a beautiful experience. She was about four or five weeks at the time. And um, it's that cycle of uh, feeding, sleeping, changing nappies. Feeding, sleeping, changing nappies. Feeding, sleeping, changing nappies. A wonderful cycle. How many of you can remember that cycle of feeding, sleeping, changing nappies? And, you know, amazing thing, uh, whilst the changing of nappies was going on, I was so proud of Joshua as a father. He was a, a really good father, is a good father, and he was, he was changing nappies, enjoying changing nappies, and Helen did a great job of changing nappies, and I was thinking about that and thinking about how many of us feel like we've got a little dirty nappy, you've got dirty nappies. Maybe when you came into church this week, you feel like you had a few dirty nappies. And I've got good news for you. God still loves you. You know, as I looked at Joshua loving Stevie Joy, the father of Stevie Joy, loving Stevie Joy, even though the nappy is dirty, it didn't change his love for Stevie Joy. And that's the revelation we need to get, is that when you've got a dirty nappy, it doesn't change God's love for you. He still loves you. He's still with you. He chose you before the foundation of the world, knowing what you would experience, what you'd go through. But there's times in our lives where where we feel like our whole world is imploding, that this, this dirty nappy is just too much, it's too much. And sometimes it feels like our visions are imploding, our dreams are imploding, our future is imploding. And as I share that with you, that's how the disciples felt, I believe, in the book of John chapter 20. They've just seen the crucifixion of Jesus. The vision, the hopes, the dreams that they came for expecting that Jesus would change the kingdom, fell away at that moment in John 20. Where after the crucifixion, they see he's dead. He's dead. And it really, it looked like their vision, their understanding of what was going on imploded. I know you've seen buildings implode. Just watch this building as it, it implodes from the center, as it blows up. And, and maybe some of us here this morning Maybe you feel like relationships have imploded. Maybe you feel like finances have imploded. Maybe you feel like dreams have imploded. Maybe even health. I, I don't know if you saw the news this week of this ship that was coming into Portland, Oregon, and uh, the power cut out. And as the power cut out, it hit this bridge in, in um, Portland, uh, Baltimore, sorry. And, and as these cars are driving across this bridge, that happened this week. People died. They fell into that water and died because no one expected that cargo ship to hit that bridge. But, you know, it's not just bridges and, and buildings that implode. It's people that implode. And, and one of those people, I believe, that was imploding on that day was, in John 20, was Simon Peter. We, we know Judas's life imploded. Judas had betrayed Jesus. And uh, then saw Jesus go to the crucifixion. And what he did is he separated from the body. He isolated and separated from the body. And the attack is real. Tell your neighbor the attack is real. 
Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And some of us, when we're under attack, our pattern is to, to isolate, as Judas did, and separate. And in that place, the Bible says, a man who isolates himself rages against all wisdom and seeks his own desire. And so Judas then, in this place of oppression and attack, away from the fellowship of the body, comes to a place of suicide. And I see in this Swatini right now, there's a, I don't know if you've noticed, there's an increase of suicides across our nation. How many of you have noticed that? Guys, we need to be praying. We need to start praying that, that, that there be a, a change because there's implosions going on. Judas had an implosion. Simon Peter had an implosion. Simon Peter thought that what was going to happen is that, that Jesus was going to kick out the Romans and, and place in this new group of believers to be the rulers of Jerusalem, a new kingdom. The Romans would be kicked out and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin would be removed. And, and in fact, Simon Peter would, and that group of people would now lead. Well, now that Jesus has gone to the cross in a brutal, brutal death, Simon Peter's struggling as Jesus has been on the cross. Now, look at John chapter 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, whilst it was still dark. And he saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter gets this news that the body has been stolen. The stone's rolled away, and, and Jesus isn't there. They've taken his body away. Can you imagine how confused he is? He thought Jesus would take over Israel, and he, he's trying to work this out. I'm sure he was also thinking of the seven sayings that Jesus had on the cross and trying to work out the relevance of it for him and for where he was at. And without going into all the seven sayings, can you, can you imagine just with me a, a few of them? The first one that I wanted you to think about is whilst the Romans are persecuting and jeering at, at Jesus on the cross, the Messiah on the cross, and the Pharisees are, are jeering at him, the scribes are jeering at him and mocking him, Jesus says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can imagine Simon Peter trying to work out, you want me to forgive these guys, these Romans? You want me to forgive these Pharisees and the scribes? They, they crucified our rabbi, our teacher. I, I can imagine the confusion. And then Jesus turns to the one, just one on, the, on, on his right and says to the, the one person being crucified, Today you shall see me in paradise. And I'm sure Simon Peter's trying to work out what that's all about. And, and then he sees it becoming dark. And, and he hears the Lord say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As Jesus takes on our sin, onto him, into him. And then Jesus cries out to tell us that it is finished. It is paid for. It is done. And then he hears Jesus say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Not that the cross takes Jesus' life. Not that the Romans take Jesus' life. Not that the Sanhedrin council takes Jesus' life but that Jesus gave his life. He could have called 70,000 angels to come and rescue him, but he stayed on the cross because of love. And he shot, he's there and he says, Father, I give my spirit into your hands. I commit my spirit into your hands. I can see Simon Peter really battling. And now Mary's report comes. The body's missing. The stone's rolled away. They've taken the body and so in verse 4, we see, so both of them, that's John and Peter, ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So I, I want to tell you a little secret here. John was considered one of the youngest disciples, and so he was able to run fast. Peter was considered one of the oldest, so he was slow. 
I, I say that because just yesterday I was doing a, a run um, through uh, Ezeweni, and we had Pastor Majaha with us, and he's young, and sure, he was way ahead of us, and us old guys at the back <laughs> coming up a long way behind, much slower. And I saw he's like John, I'm like Peter, a long, <laughs> slow. But as we get to that place, the stone has been rolled away. And so John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, coming, following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief, which had been around his head, Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. It's, it's the picture of the Passover lamb where the Afrikaman is folded and the, the mediator, the matzah is put in the Afrikaman and it's folded neatly. Tell your neighbor, folded neatly. It, it's also the picture of the coming one and the picture that it is finished. It is, it's a symbol of it is finished, paid for. And so he sees that there. And as we see that, he says in verse 8, the other disciple being John, who came to the tomb first, went in also. And when he saw, he believed. He believed. He, he realized what had happened. John caught on to what's happened. Peter, not so yet, but John's caught on. And Peter's still struggling with confusion. But Peter catches on. I mean, John catches on that Jesus is risen that he is risen indeed. So I wanted to go through this morning, what does resurrection power mean for us? Because Jesus didn't just go to the cross to pay the price for our sin so that we could be, have, that Jesus could be our role model. And yes, Jesus is our role model. He said, deny yourself, pick up the cross and follow me. Jesus is our role model. But Jesus is way more than that. And there's way more than this for us because he bore the curse. Jesus took the sin of man upon him to bear that sin so that we could be complete, so that we could be whole, so that this healing is available to every person, every generation for the whole world for all time. And so let's recognize what resurrection power means. And the first thing as we go through John 20, the first thing is recognizing Resurrection power means Jesus paid the price for all our sin. Tell your neighbor, all our sin. <laughs> Can you turn to your other neighbor and say, all your sin? <laughs> it's all of our sin. Sometimes we think it's the other person, but it's all of our sin. In uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Paul writes like this. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Now look at the highlighted bit. No longer counting people's sins against them. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So he goes to the cross, no longer counting sins against us. Look at verse 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ, so that we might receive the right relationship with Christ. But the, the question is whether we receive it or not. Consider this for a moment and bear with me. Jesus is the word. He's the water of the word. He not only took his sin onto him and into him, he also gave us the resurrection power to choose to let the word of God wash us and a fountain of water to cleanse us. And let me, let me show you this. In Zechariah 13 verse 1, the scripture says, in that day, referring to this day, today, the, the, the church, the redeemed of the Lord, in that day, a fountain, a fountain, tell your neighbor, a fountain, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David. That's us, the church. And for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanliness. For sin and uncleanliness. He paid the price that we could actively receive forgiveness for sin 
and that we would have this ongoing fountain to wash us from uncleanliness. I don't know about you, but for me, I realize I live in a fallen world with fallen men and a fallen angel. And when I say that, I mean, when you open the newspaper, so much of the newspaper is gossip, and you start reading the newspaper, and you get sucked into the gossip of the world. You start thinking the gossip that's there. Or you turn on a television program because you want to watch a good movie, and the next thing is it's not so clean, and, and that dirt sticks to you. You open up your uh, news or you open up uh, Facebook and, and someone's comments come out. And how many of us recognize we live in a, in a fallen world? If you could just put up your hand, yeah? And, and it sticks to us very quickly, doesn't it? And so the Lord has given us the power to receive forgiveness, but not just forgiveness, to have this fountain for ongoing cleansing through the Lord. He gave us this fountain. He didn't just do that. He gave us the gift of righteousness. The second point is the resurrection power gives us, means that he gives us and makes us, Jesus makes us righteous. He makes us righteous. He gives us the gift of righteousness. I, I was thinking about how Jesus, when he was born, the first person to embrace him would have been Mary, his mother, a righteous woman who received him and embraced him and washed him and, and raised him. But, but later, as we see the crucifixion and the brutal torture, and then we see Jesus going into the tomb and the stone rolled away, and Jesus walks out of the tomb into the garden, and whilst he's waiting in the garden, he meets with Mary Magdalene. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is from the area called Magdala. It was a very well-known, very busy, very active, thriving red light district. It, it was a, a district of prostitution and, and corruption. And Mary came from this area. Now, I'm not saying that Mary was a prostitute, though some theologians said that she was. But, but I would say to you that Mary definitely got healed of seven demons. Jesus healed her of seven demons. And so we know that Mary's got a past. And despite Mary having a past, despite Mary having many dirty nappies, that didn't bother Jesus at all because Jesus gives us his gift of righteousness. And so Mary is the first, Mary Magdalene is the first person to embrace Jesus as he comes out of the tomb. Look at this in John 20, verse 15. Jesus is about to... Uh, he's talking about ascension, and he says in verse 15, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Don't cling to me, don't embrace me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, now listen to this. He's now giving her a directive. Tell your neighbor it's time to awaken. He, he says, but you go to the brethren, to, you go to my brethren and say to them. So he's commissioning Mary. I want you to think about that. He's commissioning Mary. Mary Magdalene, he's commissioning because she's been given a gift of righteousness. And so many might have come in this morning feeling like, you don't know the size of my, the, my, the, the, the dirty nappy I've got. You don't know how many skeletons I've got in the closet. And Jesus knows. Not only does he know, he loves you. He chose you and he called you. And your callings and, and the gifts of the Spirit are irrevocable. He goes to Mary and he commissions Mary to go to the brethren to tell him, to tell them that he's been raised. He says to them, tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God, Mary. Sure, she's appointed as an ambassador for Christ. Jesus gave her his gift of righteousness. He gives us the gift of righteousness. It's amazing to me that the first person that is given the ministry of sharing the word now 
from Jesus to a person was a woman, Mary Magdalene. So if there's anyone here who's sitting thinking, but I, I'm a woman, I just need to keep quiet, I haven't got a ministry, I want to tell you, Jesus, he revealed himself as the risen Christ, the first person he revealed it to, was to a woman, and he gave her the ministry to go and share the word. Can you say amen with me? Amen. It's quiet in the house today. Jesus, resurrection power means Jesus makes us righteous. Jesus qualifies us. Look at Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigns through the one, much more, much more, those, now look at these words, who receive abundance of grace, who receive the gift of righteousness, will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So we have to receive it. Now, Peter, I think really Peter is like many of us. Peter's battling with pride issues and he's stubborn. He's, uh, he, he wanted his dream, his vision, his way, his way forward. And now his dream is imploded and he's trying to work out what's going on. And so maybe that's you this morning. You've come into church and, and, and you feel like you've got the strength to make it because Peter thought he could make it on his own. And you've come into the house this morning and I believe that God would have us receive forgiveness, receive his righteousness, and recognize that the resurrection power means Jesus joins us in our everyday life. Jesus is with us. Tell your neighbor, Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He's everywhere. Jesus never gives up on us. Gives up on us. Jesus is here right now ministering to us. Resurrection power means Jesus joins us in our everyday life. Peter made some bad choices. Mary Magdalene had made some bad choices. Judas has made some bad choices. But even though they'd made bad choices and they had dirty nappies, Jesus was still there for them, wanting to minister to them and through them to others. You know, the disciples, all of them, are afraid of the Jews, afraid of the Sanhedrin council. They're so afraid they've pulled out of society. Crucifixions happened. Even at this point, they're hiding in a room in the upper room in John 20. They're hiding in a room, locked the door. Look at verse 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they're afraid of the situation. And across this Swatini, I want to warn us, there's like... There's like a spirit of fear. And sometimes that fear gets us to hide. The fear of man is a snare, the word of God says. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so it, Jesus recognizes this. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. Tell your neighbor, peace be with you. It's amazing that Jesus releases this blessing. He these guys are afraid. Just get the scenario. These guys are petrified. They're terrified. They've got the door locked. They've got the windows closed. They're afraid. So Jesus steps through the wall of the house and says, peace be with you. Hey, if it had been me, I would have been afraid. <laughs> Someone just stepped through the door. They were afraid. And even though Jesus said, peace be with you, they still didn't receive it. They were still terrified. Look at the scripture. Verse 20, when he had said this, he then showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples, say with me, then. Yeah. You see, only then, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were still terrified, but when they saw his hands and his side, they realized this is Jesus. Oh, now we can be glad. So many times we're filled with fear or we're filled with pride, we're filled with stubbornness, and the Lord is speaking and saying, I forgive you, I bless you, I give you peace, but we don't receive it because we're so filled with fear. 
Fear is not from the Lord. It's a spirit. The Lord says, do not be afraid. But rather, recognize the power, love, and the sound mind that God has given us. So Jesus said in verse 21, Peace be to you, as the Father has sent me. Even though they've been afraid, he says, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So even though they've been afraid, even though they're hiding up in the room, Jesus still loves them. Even though Peter's betrayed or denied Christ three times, the Father loves them. The same with you. No matter what's happened, please know, before the world was formed, God chose you. God didn't have to send his son to die for you and I. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. God didn't have to send his son. He chose to because he loves you. And because he's God, he knows what dirty nappies you'll have. But he still loves you. And he chooses to join us in our everyday life. He says to them, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that, that's where I believe the Lord is today with us as a church, as a family. I believe God is saying, receive my forgiveness. Receive my righteousness. Receive the fact that I'm with you. I'm omnipresent. Receive the fact that I love you. Receive. Don't hide in fear and pride and stubbornness. Receive. And I believe he's saying receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to reveal the mind of Christ. God is wanting to work in you and through you. So the resurrection power means, and this is great news, Jesus is interceding for us. I don't know about you, but Helen and I worked out early in ministry that we really needed to have a lot of people praying for us. So we formed small groups of people to pray for us. And, and every time we go through a situation and we need prayer, we contact the intercessors and say, please pray for us. So I want to ask you a quick question. Do you have people who you ask to intercede with you? If you don't, please form a WhatsApp group and Get a couple of people to pray, and, and just even when your children are writing exams, ask them to pray for your children writing exams. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Share the journey, because here's the scripture. When one prays, a thousand are put to flight. When two pray together, 10,000 are put to flight in Jesus' name. Amen? Where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, it shall be done. So God would have us have intercessors, but aside from having intercessors, here's some news. We have the best intercessor, Jesus. He's interceding for us. It's an amazing revelation. The scripture tells us um, in Romans 8 verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is praying for you. <laughs> Jesus is interceding for you. And guess what? The scripture tells us love never gives up. So Jesus never gives up praying for you. Isn't that amazing? Let me show you. Remember, I'd said we're going to look at Simon Peter. And before, before the crucifixion happens, just before Jesus is arrested in Luke 22, there's an amazing scripture there where the Lord is speaking to Simon. And the Lord says to Simon Peter, Simon Simon, Yo, let me tell you, when Jesus calls your name twice, you need to pay attention. Hey, Kevin, Kevin, Simon, 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 Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. I, I want you to know that Jesus prayed for Simon, and he says here he prays for you too. Tell your neighbor, Jesus prays for you. Jesus intercedes for us. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, when you've come back to me, when you've converted to me, strengthen your brethren. So Jesus knew that Peter had this pride issue just like we do. How many of you will admit that you've got pride issues? Could you just put up your hand? Okay. 
Can I just say, those who didn't put up your hand, can you see me afterwards? I just want to lay, I want to lay hands on you <laughs> in Jesus' name. Because we've all got pride issues. And, and Simon Peter had pride issues, and, and Jesus saw that and saw where that would take Peter. Look for a moment as you, you see the very next verse. Jesus has said, you're going to get sifted like wheat, but I've prayed for you. When you return, when you converted, when you come back to me, Pick up your calling. and The calling and the gifts of the Spirit are irrevocable. Peter said, but he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. In other words, Peter thought he was self-sufficient. He was strong. He could make this. He could do this. And I tell you what, a lot of businessmen, a lot of people in ministry, a lot of us, a lot of us as human beings are working on our plan, our vision, our dream, our way forward, and we think God aligns to us as opposed to us aligning to God. And so Peter was in this track, but I, I can do this. I'm, I'm self-sufficient. I'm strong. I won't deny you. And then Peter, the Lord talks to him and says to him in verse 34, he said to you, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times so that you know me. Peter had a door open, and his door open was pride. We all have doors open. Most of us have pride as well as Peter. But the amazing thing is, if you could bear with me, in John 21, after the resurrection, in John 21, Jesus is on the beach, and he's got a barbecue going, and he's got a fish barbecue going. Whilst the disciples don't know that he's on the coast, they're out fishing. Peter is confused. He's out fishing. And all night long, you know the story, he fishes and he catches nothing. So Jesus is on the shore and Jesus calls Peter and says to the, people, the disciples, have you caught anything? He knows they've caught nothing. And so they respond, we've caught nothing. He says, Throw the net the other side, and immediately they catch a large catch. So Peter recognizes this is Jesus. He jumps overboard. He swims furiously to the coast, and he gets there, and there's already a fish barbecue there. The catch is out there, but the fish barbecue there. I, I want to put it to you. Jesus has already planned your needs. He's already got your provision sorted. We might think we have to do all the work, but God's got it sorted, and He's waiting for us to align to him. And then you know the story when Jesus asked the three questions to Peter because he's dealing with Peter's wrong alignment. He says, Peter, do you love me? Father, you know I love you. Then tend my lambs. He's reminding them, when you return, strengthen my brethren. Tend my lambs. Then the second time, do you love me? You know I love you, Father. Then feed my lambs. Then he asked Peter again, do you, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And then he says, feed my sheep. Jesus knew what Peter would go through. Jesus knew that Peter would come back. And this morning, no matter what you've been through, resurrection power means that Jesus is with you and wants to journey with you. It means that resurrection power means that Jesus is praying for you, that the gifts of the Spirit are irrevocable. The calling of God is irrevocable. Jesus is interceding for you. But it also means resurrection power is available to us. I tell you, maybe resurrection power is available to us. When Jesus said, it is finished, to tell us die, he didn't just meet some of the needs. He met all of the needs. He covered it all. He covered you. He covered me. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 1.19. He says, I pray that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Us who believe. When, when John ran in and saw the linen clothes, he believed. Peter was still struggling. 
the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated at the right hand in the heavenly places. In other words, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you and I. Listen to John 20 verse 20 again when Jesus stepped through the wall and he spoke to the disciples. He said to them, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. And I say to you this morning, peace to you, peace to you. And then Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I also send you. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying this morning, I want to remind you of the calling on your life, sons and daughters. I want to remind you of the gifts of the Spirit that you've got. Do what God called you to do. Be the light in darkness. Be that shift of atmospheres in the workplace. Be that vessel of love. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in the place that you were in. Be that. He said, and when he had said these, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Lord is saying, receive the Holy Spirit this morning. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they retained. You know, whilst being with Joshua and Caroline, they, it was beautiful to be there. And uh, one morning, um, Joshua is a great father. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, Stevie Joy was making noise, so he, he took Stevie Joy from the bedroom and let his wife Caroline sleep, and he took the Stevie Joy down into the lounge, and, and he put... Stevie Joy on his chest, and, and he was singing away to Stevie Joy. And I had woken up um, because of the time zone difference, and I, I went down to the bottom to, at about 4 o'clock to the lounge and to pray and um, get up and use the time because I was wide awake with the time difference. And I walked in, and I, I saw Joshua. He was doing the nappy changes. And as he was doing the nappy change on beautiful Stevie Joy, he was singing over her. He was singing over this baby just as he was cleaning the nappy. He was singing over her and delighting in her. And he had this big smile on his face. And it just hit me. You know, in Zephaniah, the scripture says that the Lord sings over you. The Lord dances over you. And some of us, we might feel like we're like Peter. We've got a dirty nappy and we're trying to work out where do we fit in and this nappy can't be fixed and it's too dirty for anyone to handle. Let me tell you, the resurrection power means that you are forgiven of every sin because Jesus paid the price for our sin. Resurrection power means that he gives you the gift of righteousness, whether your name is Simon Peter or your name is Mary Magdalene. Resurrection means that Jesus joins us in our everyday life. He's with you. He has not forsaken you. He will not abandon you. He will not leave you as an orphan. He's omnipresent. Resurrection power means that Jesus himself intercedes for us. And resurrection power means the same power that was available for Christ to raise Christ from the dead is available to you and I. And so can I ask you to stand this morning as I invite the worship team up? Can I ask you just to stand this morning and I wanted to put it to you that as you stand, rise and shine. The stone has been rolled away. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And he's singing over you. He's singing his blessings over you. He's singing his love over you. He's singing his hope over you. He's singing his faith over you. But can I ask you just to close your eyes for a moment and bow your heads and Maybe this morning, I just sense there are many people in the room this morning who feel like Peter, like your life has imploded, your relationships have imploded, your plans have imploded. It's like everything's collapsed around you. It feels like something's taken your legs out from underneath you, like the ship took out the support beams of the bridge or like the building that collapsed. And maybe emotionally, you feel like just you just collapsed and... And maybe you feel like, yes, like Simon Peter, you know you've been called, but you've missed the calling. And, and today, I just sense that the Lord would have us, those of us in this room who recognize that this message is for them, that the Lord would have us realign. The scripture says, 
Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has come to sift you, but I have prayed for you that you will be strong in your faith and when you return, that you fulfill my command to strengthen the brethren. And across the room, I feel like some people need to return to the Father. As we sing now, how I need your grace, Lord, more than words can say. I invite those of you who need to return to the Father just to come and kneel at the feet of Jesus. Recommit in a prophetic action of recommitting your life to the will of God, where you align your will to the Father's will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was facing an, a, the picture of having to go to crucifixion. He said, Lord, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will be done. Thy will be done. There's a moment here for each one of us that the Lord's will be done. That the Lord open His heaven, pour upon you refreshment and renewal that you would be able to strengthen your brethren, strengthen your family, strengthen your community, strengthen your family in the workplace. Can I encourage you just to come and kneel before the Lord and realign with Jesus. His will be done in Jesus' name. Can I ask you to be brave and bold? Step out now as we sing, Oh Lord, how I need your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.